Hi, everybody. How are you? It is Sagadawa, uh, the full moon in the Vaishaka month, the month when the moon is in the asterism of Vaishaka. So the full moon is in that. And uh, I'm thrilled to be talking to you from uh, my studio in, uh, in Woodstock, in the, in the mountains. And yes, I like that little face. That's the face of the future Buddha. The little face in the, on the corner there. Looks to you like my left shoulder, but to me, but it's my right shoulder. And uh, the, uh, actually it's my left shoulder, I'm sorry. And, uh, and then behind me is the Kalachakra Mandala. So I'm very happy. And uh, Shakyamuni Buddha is up there. Uh, there he is on that side. And uh, of course, he is also Kalachakra, and he is the whole mandala. But anyway, today is the day that the Tibetans celebrate the Enlightenment, and uh, some of them also the birth day, and the Enlightenment, and the, and the passing into Parinirvana, which doesn't mean final nirvana in the sense of a going away from the world. It means a total or thorough nirvana in the sense that Buddha is in his body of reality everywhere in the universe, infused and suffused and immersed in all of us and in everything throughout the infinite series of galaxies and nebulas and what have you. He certainly didn't go away. It means thorough. It means that Buddha merged with the reality that nirvana is everything. We are already nirvana, that means. <laughs> and that's why the fact that we certainly don't feel like it is simply reflecting our un misknowing, our misknowledge, our wrong understanding of the world. We think we're in a, some place of suffering and we suffer. And, and, we, but we, and we think it at a deep structural super unconscious level. So it, so it doesn't seem like we're thinking it. It seems like we're just some big thing comes and hits me. You know, somebody hits me with a club. A truck runs over me. I die. I have a cough. Uh, something just goes terribly wrong. And uh, to, us, that, to us, us, that's utterly real. And actually, it isn't absolutely unreal. It's not nothing. There were all people who only think that the Buddhist inside is to see through everything where it's all nothing. No, it's not nothing. It's way better than nothing. It's everything. It's infinite energy. It's just pure, sheer bliss of life. It's, but, it's, but when you're so sheer and it's so pure and it's so infinite, it seems to be doing nothing. It's like bliss is a big excitement when you're unblissed and you have a breakthrough into release, right? But if you're in permanent release, it doesn't necessarily feel like a breakthrough. It just, it just feels inconceivably great. But it doesn't, it's not numb. It, it, nothing is like, would be like numb. But it isn't numb. It's somehow simultaneously numb, pain, and bliss. And of those three, bliss is stronger, and therefore it's more bliss, and it's exponential bliss, actually. It's what they call bliss, freedom, indivisible. And all that what I just said, of course, in a way doesn't make sense, because you can't be in pain and be in bliss at the same time, of course. But in a way, the Buddha mind can and it can do it without making them equal. It can do it where the bliss is stronger. That's the key thing. And that's why it's better than nothing. <laughs> now all of you, or I even say, say we, because in a way, involuntarily, or you know, sort of uh, uh, habitually, I'm also a materialist. That is to say, I don't really vividly depict my future life the way I vividly depict when I'm 90. Now, I may never reach 90. I may leave my body before that. I'm already 80. 
but I, I depict it, however, and I don't do things that I think would cause agony and misery for me at 90, just in a practical way. So in a way, the possibility of 90 is more real for me than the possibility of being 10 years old in another body. Or, and, and, and therefore, and also, the idea of just not being here at all appeals to me because that's materialism. It's like Woody Allen's wonderful materialist famous joke where he said, oh, people are so worked up about dying. I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I love that. I'm sorry, but I really like it. I think it, it's, it's truly great. You know, Woody Allen, among materialist comedians, was great. And in general, all comedians are great. I'm not sure that Woody, though, is quite up to the level of Zelensky, of Vladimir, Volodymyr Zelensky. I don't think he is quite up to that. But look at Maitreya's face, Maitreya's little face. He is, he is, uh, he is so cheerful and happy. And if you just see his face, it's like he's like, a, Buddha is a cosmic comedian, I think, actually. One thing you'll get to be when you're a Buddha is a great comedian, I think. And a comedian is, doesn't mean just someone who's silly, by the way. Sometimes silliness can be comedy when it's used to release one from some notion of pompous seriousness. But it, basically, not the comedian's thing to be silly. The comedian's thing is to present something to you, your reality, in such a way that it becomes impossible for you to capture it the way you usually do in your category. And, you, and, and the release of it into a new way of seeing it makes you laugh. And laughing is like a vibration in your heart, coming from your heart, a real laugh. That is where you kind of let go your sense of grasping securely on whatever it is that's in your sphere of perception. I know that sounds that might sound complicated, but just means we he or she or it a great comedian gives us a different take on whatever it is we're used to having a take on. That's the great great job of a comedian. I, I saw by accident I went about to turn off and go to bed, the tube, I saw a, bi a short biography of uh, George Carlin. What a wonderful, amazing person, really. But very naughty in his own way. Very, very, but very much his own person, you know. Not just being brainwashed into some kind of like follow the leader sort of thing. All right. So here we are celebrating the Buddha. So the reason for making a celebration, of course, doesn't affect Buddha. He, in a way, it does because it makes us happier. And since he's one with us, Shakyamuni Buddha is. He's there all over his Buddha field. We're in his Buddha field in an extension of time, uh, just like extension of space, because, of course, the planet is in a different place by far than where it was when he attained that, when he left his ordinary seeming humanoid body and uh, but he extends everywhere because when you're a buddha you are everywhere i know that again is inexpressible right that can, that doesn't mean anything how can you be everything and everywhere then you just are everything and everywhere and there's no you is what you think but actually there is you because there's a you that's enjoying being everything that's the key thing that's called the body of enjoyment I call it the body of beatitude. and uh, But most translators call it body of enjoyment, and maybe they are better. I don't know. So Shakyamuni, thank you for demonstrating the deeds that a human needs to do to become a Buddha. You need to be first born a human. And that is to say, choose a really weird embodiment. From the point of view of an elephant, we're a dinky little wimpy character with no trunk and no tusks <laughs> and no size to, to overawe a lion and we, we have uh, 
you know, we don't have a thick hide, you know, we can't digest like bales and bales of hay uh, every hour. You know, we're like dinky. Uh, from a crocodile's point of view, we have very pathetic little teeth, you know, etc. So the choice of being a human was not an obvious choice. So that's the first thing you have to do, you have to become a human. Then you have to learn a lot. You have to have a decent mom who will not distort your view of reality. She will be the milk of human kindness to you, which will make you realize there is kindness in reality, which will give you the first taste of the basic trust in the goodness of all life, which you really need because it is the case, but misknowledge quickly covers it over the first time you have a little you have a little bump, you don't get the milk, you're hungry, or you have indigestion or whatever, you get sick, then you, you wall off, you completely wall off that, that uh, feeling. And, uh, and you start misknowing, misknowing up a storm, like I'm just me, I have to get away from all of this, I have to escape from it, I have to defend myself from it, I have to put a barrier, a bigger barrier between me and everything. And so on, and that's what that's what we do when we miss no. And then I want more milk. I want I want to grab the milk and keep it for myself, take it away from everybody else, and all this kind of greedy business. You know, that's what happens. So then next you grow up and you learn everything. Then in the process of enjoying life, you have to have fun. And uh, Buddha had super fun. He really did. He was a spoiled brat prince. Of course, with everything that anyone could desire from a materialistic point of view. Beautiful women, loving people, beautiful environment, every pleasure, you know, wonderful clothing, jewelry, good health, best medicine, great doctor, Ayurvedic doctors. You know, he really had everything and he had tremendous fun. He did. And people enjoyed him and he liked them all and they liked him. So he wasn't in a way ripping anybody off or doing anything mean to anybody. He was, and even they say he had a way of expanding his being. You know, the famous Krishna Rasalila, that's a theme in Indian literature where Krishna the God later on in the Bhagavatam is shown as multiplying his body because all the cow herdesses that he lived with in this village with cow herds, they were all in love with him. So he just multiplied his body to be the one person for each one of them. He didn't just make some of them jealous while enjoying being with another one. He multiplied himself and was with all of them simultaneously. You know, very much a sort of fantasy thing. <laughs> well, there's a trope like that about Buddha, but it's not easy to find because, you know, the monks don't like that part of the story. <laughs> it's, it, it, and people feel upset about it, but it was, it was the case. And then you have to leave it all. You have to realize there's a higher bliss not in terms of trying to escape from it, not in terms of trying to go off and hide yourself, because you realize the goodness in a way you have a deeper sense of the goodness, which enables you when you start going away from the sense pleasures uh, to avoid certain meditative pleasure states that you can get by sort of tapas, you know, mortifying yourself by suffering externally and then opening up ner your nervous system, your subtle body, to have internal experiences and reach internal states in isolation from the rest of the world and then become addicted to those, just like you were addicted, like out of desire, actually, like you were addicted to material sense pleasures out of desire. So, so, but you have to learn, you have to show that to people. You also have to be very deeply aware of your interconnectedness to other people. So there you know that when you do something, it affects them right away. And you know that from having fun. When you're having fun, and then you do you, 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 something that makes you not have fun, and you somehow dodge the fun or something, it gets too much for you or whatever, then that immediately, the people who are sharing your good vibe, they immediately are turned off as well. And you've learned that. So you're very much connected to people. So from even this time, without having a formal because at Buddha's time, he was in a place in the world where there was no formal bodhisattva vow option. 
Nobody told him uh, that you could be a Buddha, but he sort of unconsciously intimated it. He didn't have the idea that we luckily can have after his teaching that we can become this kind of infinite bliss being. And therefore we become motivated to do that and we're willing to give up little pleasures in order to do it and even learn to use pleasure in, on the way of doing it rather than just get lost in them. So then, then he had his six years of self-mortification. And actually Buddhists don't always do that. In worlds where there's less violence and beings live longer and they're more sort of easygoing and the world is more abundant, like the Maitreya Buddha, that one who's smiling there, the comedian Buddha, he is not born in the warrior class like Buddha was, because at his time in the world, the intellectual class, the priest class, the Brahmin class, they are the elite. And therefore he attains Buddhahood in one day when he leaves his being a Brahmin priest in the, in the, in the divine temple, you know, the theistic temple. He leaves there to become a Buddha and he smashes the sacrificial uh, pole that he inherits from his father. Instead of using it to run the rituals that are run in the temple, he smashes it and in, in, into thousands, millions of shards. And then he gives each different shard. He has immediate magical powers. And as a Buddha, he gives each shard to people and then they become uh, enlightened arhats in his, in his retinue and bodhisattvas right away. They don't have to struggle and suffer the way we do. So there, there are worlds where it's easier for the being. And of course, you can discuss why or not, but we, I don't want to get into that. I just want to say, in a kind of world like our world, you have to do these rigorous, difficult things that Buddha does do. And he did them. And then you, you, then you encounter uh, the devil, which is people's misknowledge uh, sort of a personification of that misknowledge that makes people greedy and and angry. And they, of course, they think they're fighting a world that is overwhelming to them. And so the devil, and the, the devil in, uh, his name is Mara, and uh, he, in, San, in, in the Hindi and, and Sanskrit language, and he, uh, languages, and he, he lives in a kind of heaven, of a pleasure heaven, actually. He's more like a pimp than like a big grisly death demon like the Satanist living in the underworld. He doesn't live in the underworld. Yama, there is a god of death called Yama who lives in the underworld. But long time ago, Yama is tamed by Buddhas. And Yama is actually helpful. <laughs> I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that's, and that's I might get to that today, but maybe not. Anyway, he meets Mara, and then Mara tempts him with his last, you know, confusion, says, who asked you to be a Buddha? Aren't you being very egotistical, saying you're going to save all beings from suffering? You've rediscovered the ancient teaching of all Buddhas, the immortal teaching, the eternal teaching of Buddhas. You're going to really liberate everyone and so on. And isn't that really egotistical? And who, who asked you? you know? how, how are you getting off to do that? And Buddha said, well, everyone asked me, actually. Even you asking me. <laughs> he said, and the reason I can is because I did so many things for you in past lives, and I remember it. And I did everything for every other being, and I remember it. And uh, therefore, they automatically, when they even see me, they want to open to their higher potential. It makes them realize it's possible subliminally at first, and then eventually they can quickly come to his realization. And they can be just like me. I'm not going to lord it over them. Being a Buddha doesn't mean I'm going to lord it over anybody. I'm going to help them become as happy as I am. Being a Buddha means being totally happy and having, adding to that personal happiness the ability to help everyone else be totally happy. How about that? Isn't that fun? That's really fun. That's a possibility. Life can have, in other words, as I used to say as a child, not knowing what I was saying, life has a happy ending. It doesn't mean necessarily... It does actually mean the death of this life in the sense that death is where the life you, you meet the life force more fully than the body that you have has become worn out or injured or crushed in an accident or something happened to it. And it can no longer embrace as much of that huge life force as 
as it as the life force sort of needs because <laughs> it's so powerful. It's like you're you know you have they no longer have aqualung to breathe underwater you know and you're in this vast ocean of bliss and you don't have the right kind of lung to inhale the bliss, so you leave that body looking for a better body. But if you leave it and you have accustomed yourself to a structure, a deep structure of fear, hate, anger, greed, confusion, you will not necessarily recognize what is a better body, a more open, vast, huge body. You won't recognize it. And you'll actually look for a more boundaried, more protected body. And seemingly to a self-centered person, being something more protected, has a big armor, it's like very fierce. It's it's like very isolated from other things, so things can't bother it. Very strong, whatever you know, whatever you, whatever your predisposition would be to think you wouldn't you'd be safe, or in some completely isolated, lonely place, where there, there isn't anybody else and anything else, which then would lead you to a misery of loneliness, kind of hell, of absolute loneliness or seemingly absolute loneliness. There's no absolute loneliness, but seeming. So, in a way, life has a happy ending. And, that's, and death is a useful thing. When you're in deep pain, when the body doesn't work, when someone's torturing you, death is a useful way of getting away from where your material body is captured in a bad material situation. So it has a happy ending. If we understood death, of course, we think of death as the absolute tragedy, and it is for human who f has not fulfilled their human existence to their own satisfaction, then they feel it's being cut short. And that's really a tragedy for them. And that's a, but actually, ultimately, that's a misunderstanding. Because if they've lived human life and learned enough in a human life to understand that openness, that openness, that love, that patience, that receptivity, that generosity, all those things that connect us to everything at whatever degree we're capable. That's where joy lies. And therefore, that's what we want when we are in a moment of vastness, which is the moment of death. We want that vastness. We shouldn't fear it. We, shouldn't, we should give ourselves to it. And the more generous we've been in life, the more able we are to do that. So we can, then, then instead of fighting to keep a body that we can't, we give it away to life and that's that's a kind of grandma death where she's smiling blissfully and you feel it when you're in the room those who are expert hospice workers know that that's a person who lived very generously and not paranoidly and not not viciously and 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 narrow-mindedly okay so that's the way of using human life and someone who is living open-minded and they haven't used it to really open to had the opportunity to open to more and more deep and powerful and beautiful things then death is seen as a tragedy rightly because they haven't used their awesome human opportunity to the full so don't think i'm preaching but don't think buddhism buddha taught us a death cult in any way no he taught us actually there is no death really there's infinite life is reality and it's all good this is what he taught us Okay, so therefore we must keep a human life where we can learn more about that and we can critically undo more of our narrow-minded misknowing and become more and more open-minded as hugely and vastly as we can. And we can go right into the mandala. I don't know how to point to it on the screen. I don't know. How to... I go right into the center of the mandala, which is the center which is our own love, our own loving heart filled with love and totally glorious and joyful. That is the center of the, it's like a palace, palace of divine love. It's right in the middle of our own heart. Don't have to go find Buddha or God or anybody else or Jesus. Jesus was pointing to that. You have that. That is in you. You be like me. Be like the daisy in the field. You give, you know, be, be, uh, say, you know, do unto others, you know. Love your neighbor as much as you do. And that's you. then you're in your love palace in the center of your heart. It doesn't mean you don't exist and you're trampled and you dissolve. You. You're willing to give yourself. But when you're willing to give yourself, then you be, what you are becomes 
a gift to the universe. That's what Jesus taught. That's what Buddha taught. Jesus didn't have time to, to add to the curriculum very much. And therefore, that curriculum is being expanded now by Drew Boos and Chris Boos who are finding Buddha's expansions of the curriculum. Nothing new. They remain devoted to the loving God, not the nasty, mean one, to the, to the loving Jesus. And yet they, they realize the loving Buddha is their buddy. And they like him, and he likes them. They're all working together. And they can be utterly faithful and use the methodologies given by the other ones. And, it did, you know, Jesus and the wonderful Jewish people, of which Jesus chose to be one, he incarnated as one, they have a lot of useful things to help us with. Buddhists can learn a lot from them. And they can learn a lot from Buddhists. That's where we're going on this planet. Wonderful place. Okay? So, then you have to, after doing all that, making a lot of people happy as a Buddha, in his case for 45 years old, you have to pick a culture where they're not going to kill you for being happy. <laughs> and in ancient Eurasia, on this planet, that was India. You know, that was the Indus Valley. That was the Ganges Plain, you know, and, uh, and uh, the, the Brahmaputra. You know, that was, but they were, that, a lot of part of areas of that were jungly and so forth, but those were, those main rivers fed in the great Himalayan, you know, uh, loam, water, fed the, the agriculture of that area. So they were, it was very generous and very wealthy. It was like California. It's like Southern California of, uh, Southern, Northern, all of California. Uh, the Indus Valley was. Eden. It was kind of Eden of Eurasia. So you pick a place like that. So they won't kill you for being happy. Like they don't mind. They're not that jealous of someone who's happy. <laughs> okay? As, as the Europeans did their mystics. As the, as the West Asians and the North Africans did their mystics because of the harshness and the paucity of their environments. The Danube area was good actually, and some areas in Turkey. But a lot of those western areas were not that rich was their problem. Okay. So then you pick that so you can live a long life and then you teach for 45 years. And then at least, in, in, in Maitreya's world, I'm sure 800 years because people live very, very long in his world, at his time, in the, far, in the future, after we get past these difficulties of the, toward the end of the Shakyamuni era. And, um, which we will, don't worry. And then you stage a death, a parinirvana, a leaving of the body. And you do it peacefully and meditat meditatively. And you actually show those who are sensitive to the inner energy of a body. They perceive another, they can, they have the ability to perceive another's inner situation. They're like telepathic and clairvoyant. And so he demonstrated how he traveled in the cosmos with his mind and his subtle body, while his coarse body in the human plane, in the what's called the desire realm, was, was uh, just lying there, sopping to breathe. Uh, but that doesn't mean becoming nothing. Remember, that means getting more vast, actually, leaving the confinement and the restriction of a humanoid body that he, that he was demonstrating as. Oh, actually, already he was more than his body. He was already everything as a living Buddha from the age of 35, which is how he was able to teach so effectively because you can really teach a student well when you feel you are the student simultaneously. <laughs> but you don't interfere. You can't be the student's understanding. But you can see where the student misunderstands. And then you can present to them whatever it is that will help them expand their understanding. And you can do that really effectively when you know just where the, where the bottlenecks are, where the pinch points are in their thinking, in their, in their neuronal structure, in their chakras, you know, their, their, their nerve flowers, nerve lotuses, you know, 
Ganglia does sound kind of disorganized, but a lotus or a flower is ni nicer, like the brain. It's like a flower. It's like a beautiful plant. And when you know where the problems are there, you can, you can be a great teacher to them. And he was for and countless numbers of people. So then you leave, because in leaving, you help people overcome the tendency that people who are not happy have of depending on someone who is happy for the good vibes. And so terrible dependence on the Buddha, the sort of new head of the new patriarch of the, of the saintly order of those who are already to some degree enlightened, who did depend, however, for the vastness of the happiness of Buddha on the personal presence of Buddha, because they still didn't fully realize their full Buddhahood. But they were enlightened enough to be able to depend very effectively and feel so happy being just around the Buddha. Well, some of them sort of extinguished themselves. They left their bodies, even though they didn't know how yet to leave their body and go into being infinite because they weren't Buddhas yet. They hadn't really trod the path of compassion enough. And so they ended up in some divine plane of isolation, like a something like a formless realm, close to, close to a formless realm. And then they got stuck there for a short, long, long time. And many, some of them have are waiting for another Buddha even to come back because they haven't overcome that dependency. And so the patriarch of the order, Mahakashapa, he had to order those monks no more self-immolations. And they didn't do it by pouring gas on themselves and lighting a match. They just combusted. They just enhanced the fire element in themselves and just poof. They, they pulverized their, their human body. I started doing that because of thinking maybe they would pursue Buddha to wherever he'd gone still having some little slightly nihilistic view of what nirvana is, instead of realizing that nirvana is everything. When you, when you happily totally merge with it, when you totally realize its true nature, its freedom nature, and your freedom, that which means you can only realize reality's freedom nature when you realize you are that reality and it's your freedom nature. That's the only way you can realize it, right? Okay, so this is, I just rehearsed the Buddha's body in a certain impressionistic way as an offering to you and to Buddha. And uh, I, I, you get inspired to do it, you see the wonderful palace behind me, which is called what kind of the fivefold palace, seeming to be, which has three buildings. The building of body is the outer one, building of, it has actually five buildings, but it looks like three. And the, the three are the body, speech, and mind, which are the three components of the continuum of every living being, and even a Buddha being, you know, who is beyond death. Is that a still, that's definitely living. That's a super living. That's an infinitely living being, either finitely or li infinitely living being. They have body, speech, and mind in their continuum. In a way, they're one thing, but they can be divided into three. And those are those three buildings. And in the center is the Great Bliss penthouse, which is a fifth, fourth palace, Great Bliss itself, which is where there's no difference between being in the penthouse and being everywhere. So it's not, it, 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 it comforts a materialist in thinking that they're somehow at the summit of something, but actually they're in every atom of every mountain in every direction. <laughs> It's what they surprisingly discover when they reach there. And then outside is the fifth building, which is presented like a kind of garden. And that is the garden of activities. That is the, that is the, 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 the field of activities, field of action of a, of a Buddha being, which is all loving, loving outreach to all, all life. And the circle with all the syllables in the circle represent 88 different um, entities, beings, that a Buddha, that you become when you're a Buddha. And they include like things like for a specially designed humanoid, designed by love, humanoid, not created out of nothing, but designed by love, 
out of what already was there and was not being enjoyed by people. The special Buddha, Buddha field, as it's called, it has the 12 astrological houses, astronomical houses, you know, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, uh, you know, Sagittarius, Pisces, right? All of them. It has 30 days of every month, every lunar month. It has sun and moon. It has all kinds of of uh, beings, gods and angels and things. That's what those 88 represent. And then there, of course, another 700 or 600 inside the buildings. All of the deities and angels and uh, all of their retinues and so forth are all in there. And that's the universe of the of the and all time is in there also. So although we although we people like me and I'm just assuming you, but some of you may already be Buddhas, in which case you don't mind me just including you in a general you. When we all have the we all on a day like this we think about it, we decide, you know what, I'd really like to be Buddha. A Buddha. I want to be my own Buddha. I want to be a Buddha for everyone else which is, in other words, the most effectively loving and compassionate being to be of happy and happy and blissful being to help others find freedom from suffering and happiness and bliss. That's what I think. If it's possible to become such a thing, I want to be that. And the minute we have that true determination, the minute we allow our mind to be open enough to embrace the possibility of that, in that minute we're already there. Actually, because the sort of linear time where you're always trapped in a present that you can never quite find because it has no duration <laughs> and now has no duration. You know, like a line, you, know, you cross a line, but actually a line has no width, so you never really can cross it. You can go over some sort of threshold, thin, uh, you know, parallelogram, <laughs> you know, something with, with thickness. And then when, we, when you're in it, who's in it? And which part of you, which atom of you is the one that's in that line? In other words, the, even the fantasy of crossing a line is a fantasy. It's a concept. In reality, there's no line. In reality, there's no now. There's only past and future flowing into each other. At first, it seems, when we're trapped in an invisible now, in an inexperienceable now, and then when we're free from that, we're in infinite time, as we're just as perpetual and eternal in our blissful happiness as we are in everywhere in space, infinite. It's infinite and simultaneously not in any point, and in every point. Free from concepts, in other words. Concepts you could, conceptually you can only be in a point or outside the point, right? And that's dualism. But when you're Buddha, you're beyond that. So you're, you're both in them and not in them and everywhere else and, and in them and everywhere else. You know, whatever you can say about it, you can make a story out of it. Okay? So the minute we want to do that, we are everywhere in that. And this is a palace of time also. So that means we have opened, and it's like we have opened because it's a concept to think I'll be a being who's infinitely happy and everything. that's also a bunch of concepts. It's the opposite of how we feel, actually, usually. But on the other hand, we have, we have imagined the opposite of feeling trapped in an inadequate situation. So we've imagined a reality where everything is completely adequate to everyone. And that's the one that Buddha announced, he discovered. And that is the reality of us now. So we have opened a tiny door in the middle of our field of being and stream of being. We have opened a tiny door to Buddhahood. But, and we're there in that door. And that door, in the inconceivable plane, we're already there. And in the conceivable one, we're not yet, but we can, but the conceivable, but the inconceivable one reaches into the conceivable one in such a way that we can plot the path and the map of how to get there. In time, we can say, be here now. Like this great saint, the great American, you know, Jew Boo, Jew Hindu, Hindu Boo, I'll call him. 
Hindu boo. <laughs> Hindu Chris boo. Yeah, it was because the Jews manifested as Jesus. So they were, the first Christian was a Jew. So Hindu Chris boo. And the Muslims just wanted to be Jews. That's all. They wanted to renew Jews against some local, local religion pilgrimage business. <laughs> they wanted to meet the, uh, the transcendental deity that you can't have an image of because it's inconceivable. So they touch inconceivability. Everyone does. And we do. And by just imagining that, on this day we have opened that door in our heart and mind. And therefore we're there. And it's like it was a brilliant Descartes, actually. People always put him down. We want to be holistic, blah, 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 Descartes. But he was brilliant. He knew that his point X, Y was only a concept, but it's a useful concept in managing when you're trapped in the conceptual world, understanding its reality. And that was part of enlightenment. So people in Buddhism who don't want to use the word enlightenment because they think it's tainted by the materialist enlightenment of the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries, they should take another think, think again. Or as the Apple phone says, think different. Yes, it's an awakening, but it's an awakening to an enlightenment. It's not an awakening like you, get, you leave the world, like so the world is like asleep, and then you wake up and you're not in the world, so you're gone, you're finished. The world is finished, and you're in some psycho state of isolation. <laughs> That's not Buddhahood. No way. Nirvana is not a psychotic state. No. Nirvana is right here. It's right now. Like the dear Matthew McConaughey said, the frontier of the cosmos is not Mars, it's planet Earth. It's fixing, saving, loving, first loving, then fixing, then saving planet Earth. Because we are, planet Earth is our mother. We are in her womb, her exquisitely designed womb, atmospheric womb, and soil and food redolent, food replete womb. So we should stop destroying food by trying to grab our neighbors, Mr. Putin. No, cut that out. Back out, go back out. Join the regular people again. Stop trying to be some kind of imperial Christo-fascist. Become a happy comedian. Go to comedy school. Study with Zelensky. If you felt you were genuinely repentant, he might teach you. <laughs> That's what you need. You don't need whatever weird chemical they're giving you for whatever disease you have. You need to do like that guy, I forgot his name here in America, who laughed his way free of cancer. And just swap George Carlin. Just have them play down there in the cellar of the Kremlin, wherever deep bunker you are under your dasha, whatever. Play all the, you know, Chris Rock. Play him imitating you and laugh your ass off. And you, that tumor will just be completely <laughs> embarrassed and ashamed. And it will leave your whatever it is colon and you'll be okay really and your brain it'll pop out in your otherwise it pop out in your brain and everywhere you will not be able to enjoy being the saving emperor holy the holy moscovian emperor <laughs> forget about it you you know you'd end up having a fight with donald trump who wants to be the holy washingtonian emperor you know, you put him up to it, but once he's there, he's not going to want to cater to you, believe me. Just like you don't really consider him, do you? So why should you trust him the way you do? The way you spend so much money on his real estate, you know, collapses. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. So, sorry to be political on this day, but you know what? Buddha's enlightenment was political. He immediately started a huge revolution in India. He said, okay, you know, fighting wars between city-states, between Kosala and, and Kapilavastu 
and Mathura and etc., etc., it is not fun. Being a male chauvinist and having a bunch of male chauvinist Vedic deities and making animal sacrifices to them is not fun. The animals don't have fun. People don't have fun. Having a, you know, you know, when you're in an agricultural thing with plenty of mangoes, huge agricultural thing, you don't need to eat meat much. So nonviolence is more fun. Leave the cows alone. And and let people let women join the monastic or the, the 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 mendicant order and let them become educated and enlightened and let your warriors out of their troop phalanxes and wars and let them become enlightened and let your merchant sons go discover enlightenment and the low caste geniuses they can't just clean your latrines and so forth you do that and actually, I'm going to make a special trial place for you. And I want you, some of you, to migrate to the north. And I'm going to. And there's a country called Shambhala, and uh, which we can hide from the ordinary people. And then I want you to be really happy up there. I know it'll take a long time, maybe 30, 30 centuries, but I don't care how long. That's part of my plan for this planet, and it's political. It's very political, meaning it's taking the polis, which were the city-states in which Buddha was born, and there were 16 of them vying for supremacy, and eventually the state of Magadha became the empire, uh, Pataliputra and so forth, and that's what's really underlying what's called the UP now. Not only the state of Bihar, but Patna and Lucknow and so on, but UP, the sort of heartland, Gangetic plain heartland. And... Uh, and that became one of the city-states dominated the other ones. They killed people. It was horrible. When Buddha died and did his power nirvana, one the Magadha guy who had killed his parents, actually, in the in the in the, the, the Kshatriya ethic of just grab what you want whenever you want it. And he was crucifying people up and down the road. So the king so they stopped temporarily after he passed away and went to have a war over who would honor his relics more. And so then the, the monks divided the relics and gave it to the eight contenders. At that point, it was Magadha hadn't conquered everybody, all 16 of them. So Buddha's ceasing to be, choosing not to be a king, choosing not to enforce the Dharma, uh, his version of the Dharma, the Dharma of freedom, the Dharma of happiness, because he, then there would, people would fight him and they'd be, it would not make people happy. So he didn't associate it with a particular kingdom of the 16 kingdoms. He traveled through all of them and taught everyone. He didn't associate it with the Kshatriya caste, which is the highest one at that time, or the Brahmin caste, which were their highest servants. He didn't associate it with males. He accepted females. He fussed about it because he knew it would be hard to get the males to let go of their slaves, the females. Notice how hard the time the Me Too is having on the planet. But he did admit them, and there were many who were enlightened and deeply grateful, and they have been ever since, wherever his teaching has spread. And here in America, you women, teachers, Lama Tsutrim, and you Zen Roshi this and Roshi that, you great women, you are really coming to the fore. And, you, and Lama Tsomo, yes, there's a Lama Tsomo there, yes, Lama Tsomo. I usually am not remembering names well at 81. My dear friends at Green Gulch and at the and the UC and at SF ZC SFZC and uh, all lots of them all over the country in Rochester etc. Women. That's what they are. They can be Buddhas, and they they are going to be. They actually have a head start. The men are really going to freak when the women really go for it, because they're already put settlers, so they wouldn't have been born as women in a planet where women are oppressed. They were reborn there to undo that. You know, Bodhisattvas. The planet itself is a woman who got tired of making supper and therefore decided she would become a giant food grower, and namely a planet that feeds billions of people, if not abused. And of course, we are abusing her. Look at the idiot the idiot Kremlin guy, the bad comedian Putin, 
the, the lesser comedian Putin. He's go in order to grab and rob Ukraine of its wonderful food. He's destroying all the food. It's putting people who depend on it all over the world into starvation. Really. <laughs> it's just so sad. But what's good about the modern thing is everybody knows everything. We can all see it everywhere. And because bad people can use that openness to brainwash us, and there are too many of us are brainwashed. But we also can see and know everything. And even we're brainwashed, our subconscious will know. Our subliminal awareness will know. And we know what people are doing. And therefore they will not be getting away with these things that they did for thousands of years. They cannot. No, no, no. You will have to let go of your imperial positions, you communists, supposed pseudo-communists. <laughs> There's nothing socialist about a dictatorship. Completely fake lie. There's no socialist with the dictatorship characteristics. So it's, it's, a, it's a complete, it's a contradiction that is unreconcilable only by the evaporation of the dictatorship, the withering of the dictatorship, or the voluntary, generous, self-transcending of the dictatorship, which means, like Gor the great Gorbachev and the lesser but also good Yeltsin, just give the power to the people, become a multi-party system, give in to democracy, give in to regionalization, give in to local people just controlling their local areas, stop these leftover empires. That's what it calls for. That's what will make a happy planet. When the people who live nearby can avoid cutting down the trees they depend on nearby them. Bravo for the Parisians. They're not allowing some morons to cut down the trees around the Eiffel Tower. Bravo. That's local management. That's what we need. Okay? So anyway, lots of love to everyone. Sorry for ranting and raving. Thank you, Buddha. Thank you, Maitreya, for being with me here. And uh, let every day be Enlightenment Day. Actually, this year in China and Sri Lanka and other Buddhist countries, so-called Buddhist countries, there were they had, they celebrated this Enlightenment Day a month earlier, because the Tibetan system coming from India and from Shambhala, <laughs> Kalachakra astronomy, because of the lunar calendar, every year. Every three years or so, there's a 13th month in order to fit the lunar calendar with the solar calendar because the solar calendar is five days, five, six days longer than the lunar calendar, which is exactly 360 and 365, six, and, and a few, and some hours and minutes. And so you have to adjust for that every three or four years. So we're doing it uniquely. Tibet is upholding the ancient Indian and the Shambhalonian way of measuring time. And we are celebrating it in this full moon today. And thank you for being with me. Let us dedicate the merit of listening to me if you managed it without, and managed to stay awake. <laughs> and uh, by the way, if you live in India, don't listen to this till later in the day because you're going to hear His Holiness finishing a marvelous teaching online from Dharamsala. If you go to the Dalai you can find it. And he did it yesterday too. And if you're in the East Coast, you have to do it on the 12th and 13th rather than the 13th and 14th because you, in the U.S., because it's a mid, middle of the night. And then in Europe and here and there, there are different time zones. But you can find that all out on Dalai giving a wonderful teaching and a magical blessing, actually, of the Bodhisattva of infinite compassion, who manifest infinite embodiments, and all the great teachers of all the great teachings in the world, whether they call themselves Buddhists or not, doesn't matter. That is who that being is. And it's those beings are, let's say. There's no one big, no one is a big shadow of the other one. Because they are there with every being, this point. So they are, they're only as big as the beings they're serving, actually. All these different great leaders and teachers. Okay? So Dalai Lama is a fully sincere ecumenist. And I try to be. All right? So we dedicate the merit 
to everyone becoming a Buddha and themselves. She, he, it, the non-binaries as well. All of them. LGBTQ+. Plus, plus, plus. plus. May they all become perfect, blissful, bliss, freedom, indivisible Buddhas. And three-bodied, reality body, beatitude body, emanation, serving body. May they do that. Okay? Thank you very much. All the best.